By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday, so that means we bring you more magic from the Camel Trophy, an old school tournament from Arnhem. And we have reached the top eight. And in this matchup, we are going to see an Atok player who is sitting on the left, taking on an Arnhem Gannon player who is sitting on the right. So this... This is going to be exciting, I can promise you that. And before we're going to the actual games, I'm going to do a short deck deck. I don't have any pictures, but I have an idea what these decks are about, and I will share that with you. If you want to go straight to the games, you can check the description below, click on the timestamp, and it'll take you straight to game number one. The player on the left is playing with a deck I've called Atok in the Desert, and I've called it In the Desert because he's actually playing with deserts. I mean, how cool is that? And the interesting thing about this matchup is he will probably encounter Savannah Lines. So the desert could actually be a big deal. And I think in general, when I look at this Atok deck, uh, we see, of course, the Atok and the two artifacts behind it, Ankh of Mishra and Mana Vault. Those are like those artifacts that are really nice to chew up by the Atok. Of course, it will be Black Vices in there, and that's all, you know, your basic thing. Now, he's playing with Blood Moons. Then again, you can say, okay, most Atok decks have Blood Moons. Maybe, but you also have the uber-aggressive Atok decks, and they don't play with Blood Moon, and he's playing Blood Moon main, and I think Blood Moon, again, can be a decisive card in this matchup. His opponent is playing with three colors, like really strong. A traditional Urnum Ganon is just going to do white and green, but he's really got a lot of blue in here, so a lot of duels, a lot of special lands. Blood Moon can be a big deal here. And another card here that I noticed is Nevenerl's Disc, because the Disc... I mean, it's more controlling. It's a card you would expect more in a deck that has a long-term plan, like a Troll Disco, for example, you know, that goes more on the value train. An Atog deck usually is a deck where you burn through all your resources as quickly as possible just to beat down your opponent. And the cool thing here to see is that's not the case uh, in this in this particular brew. He's also uh, playing with Suchis instead of Juggernauts, for example. So he's really... You could almost call this deck Atog the Tactician because it's a little bit more about the mid game in this deck than it is about the early game. So that's what I find really interesting. And by the way, you don't see any direct damage here, but of course he's playing with Lightning Bolts and I'm sure he's also playing with Chain Lightnings. I mean, we'll just have to see while he's, uh, he's playing this game. I'm not sure if he plays with Fireballs, maybe one, but I don't think he's playing with too many of them. So this is the deck of the player on the left. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent. The player on the right is playing with an Urnum Ganon deck, but wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not your traditional Urnum Ganon. So this one is blue, white, and green. And it's not just blue for the power. You see those three power pieces. Obviously, they're going to make a difference if you play Urnum Ganon with or without power. I think it makes it stronger. Blue power makes everything stronger. So I'm sure it makes this brew stronger. Um, and But what we see as well, he's also playing, I believe, with a full playset of Surrender Befreeds. His deck in general is very creature heavy. There is a lot of beef in this deck. It's almost a green deck as to the beefiness. I mean, Arnim Ganon being, being green, of course, but he also has Sarah Angels. He has the Surrender Befreeds. He has a full playset of Savannah Lines. He's playing with Factories. So there's a lot of way to play very aggressively with this brew. And because it's an Arnim Ganon deck, you will also see... Four Birds of Paradise going to ramp, you know, so he can use ramp to play an Armageddon after playing a big threat, but he can also just ramp into a lot of creatures. I believe in this deck he's not playing with three Armageddons, but with two, so that means that there are actually games where you won't even see an Armageddon, but that's not a big problem, I think, for this deck. This deck is really putting on, putting down big creatures and, and winning it, and, you know, I think this this is one of those decks that has to win through combat damage. I think in this matchup, that is not going to be a big problem because the Atok deck is also a deck that, you know, wants to fight. But I can imagine against certain decks that are really well protected, like you've got some combo decks that are really good at just protecting what they have and building, building a fort around themselves, making sure that combat damage cannot get in. I think with those decks, this deck uh, may have a bigger problem. Uh, that being said, the Atok deck can be very quickly and explosive, and of course it has direct damage. So especially pre-sideboard, I'm very curious to see uh, how the Urnum Ganon deck is going to hold up. So again, this is Ur I'm calling it Urnum Ganon, but it is definitely an Urnum Ganon with a lot of blue and a lot of beef. 
Okay, let's go to the matches and let's check out this quarterfinal of the Camel Trophy. Game number one. We see the players shuffling here still. So this is a quarterfinal, so they're battling for a place. And they're rolling the dice. Looks like the Ernum Gannon player can start if he wants to or can choose if he wants to start or draw. And uh, they're battling for their place in the semifinals, already having reached top eight. So congratulations to both of these players. And the uh, the Atok deck, of course, I think pre-sideboard, maybe the favorite to take this first game. There we see the hand. Interesting to note about this Urnum Gannon deck is that it has a lot of blue cards in it. Oh, look at that. He's shuffling them away. And that's already a, a good start, I would say, for the Urnum Gannon player without doing anything. Of course, we did see that uh, time twister there in the hand of the player on the right. His name is Gideon. And that means that Gideon will not be very tempted to play that time twister. I don't think it's an exceptionally good card, actually, again. Oh, look at this! Black Lotus into an Urnum. I wanted to say a particularly good card in this matchup because the Aether player is mo more likely to run out of fuel pretty quickly. There's an attack for four. And look at that! It looks like Gideon, the Urnum Gannon player, is going to be the aggressor here instead of the Atok player. So my world is upside down right now. I didn't see this coming. And he's... He's already cornered in the Atok player. Look at what he can do. Tapping that Mana Vault. Interesting here. An Ank of Mishra. That means that both players are getting two damage every time they put a land into play. And that Atok, of course, can eat the artifacts up, gaining plus two, plus two. And now Gideon has to give Force Walk to the Atok. That's not a great thing to do. On the other hand, he is the aggressor. A Swords would be really nice here for Gideon. He's attacking first with his 4-5 Urnum Jin. There's a tap. And he gets some food. So it's now a 5-7. Or no, sorry, a 5-6. And the Urnum dies. But it has cost the Atok player two of his artifacts. And especially that Ankh is kind of... You don't want to do that. You'd rather like first let your player play out a card. But in this in this situation, I think it's the right decision. We see a chain lightning here, and an attack for one. But there's a flip, and that's a hit here on the Atok. And there's another Atok hitting the board. But an Atok without artifacts is just not as scary. There's an attack by the Mishra's factory, taking damage. Oh, and he is playing the Time Twister. I'm liking this. He's going full throttle. He just wants to get. New creatures probably hoping to hit like a Sarah Angel or a Surrender Perfreet or an Urnum Jin. And I think a Flyer is exceptionally good in this matchup. And there they go. I do like this. I like it when you're playing, you know, you're playing the Time Twister. You might as well just go for it. And oh, again, drawing that Black Lotus again. Mox Pro, meaning he has four mana. This is just crazy. Can he deploy a big threat? Can he play an Urnum? You can see his hand a little bit. I do see a Surrendip. Exactly. There's the Surrendip of Freed hitting the table. 3 4 Flyer deals one damage during your upkeep. And this is where Gideon's deck differs from the other, the more traditional Urnum Gannon deck, is that, that really big splash of blue. It's not just the blue power, but also these Surrendip of Freed's. And I don't have his entire list, but I'm sure there's also a Brain Geyser in there. Although I'm not entirely sure. There we see a Black Lotus from the other side of the table. The Atok player playing a Mana Vault here. So we have some artifacts now hitting the table, making that Atok stronger, of course. Tapping here for 5, for 4, okay. There is a Chaos Orb, so 2 land floating. And he flips on the white source. Interesting. On the Mox Pearl, cracking the Lotus. What else does he have? And there is a Blood Moon. That can be very strong in this matchup. All the land of Gideon are now basic mountains. And that now I understand why he chose the Mox Pearl first as a target. That's actually very good magic. And then he attacks. And of course, because all the mana now... Or out, the Mox Pearl is out, so chances to disenchant are slim here. So it looks like the tables have turned. Attacking here for three. 
but they're all mountains now. He does have those two Moxen. Ooh, this is important. Chaos Orb probably going to flip on the Bad Moon. Will he hit? Ooh, he's, he's hitting it. It's going so fast. So that means he's back in business playing out his Birds of Paradise passing turn. And if he can find another Blood Moon, he's in trouble again. But of course, that Birds is now there as well. And Moxen and Birds of Paradise are just great weapons against Blood Moons. And there is a Suchi hitting the table. Of course, Gideon can choose to keep his factories at bay to block them on the Suchi if need be. Going for the aggressive, attacking him for three again. He's going to eight. Playing a time walk. And there's that blue power. That means at least three more damage. He does have a regrowth in hand. Regrowth the time walk. Playing it out again. That means he's he's gaining two turns here. Wow. This could be at the end of it. So this is his first extra turn. You see the dice here on his pack of cards. Attacking here. Going to five. Taking his turn again. So this is the last extra turn. Going to two. And passing turn here. So he didn't manage to kill him even after two extra turns. Look at this. Killing the Serendip. Wow, this is interesting. I actually thought those two extra turns would would finish it, but it's not enough. Atok player is on two life. Ernim Gen player on eleven. And of course the Atok player can no longer play out any land, but then again he can simply sack it to the Atok, his uh, Ankh of Mishra, and then he can play out a land again. We see this block here from the factory. And will we see a shatter here from the Atok player upon activation? And choosing to block here. Not quite sure what happened with the desert. Maybe people that are watching this can tell me. I, am I missing something? Attacking here with the Suchi. Going to seven. And look at this. Can the Atok player win this one? That would be quite spectacular. Having to jump now with the Birds of Paradise. Playing out a Sarah Angel. Oh, this could be the game. I wonder what he's going to do. Probably going to attack with both his Atok and his Suchi just to put pressure on. And remember, the. Ernan player doesn't want to use the Sarah as a blocker, obviously, because he needs that to finish the job. And he's putting some food in the Atox mouth, so it's now a 3-4 creature. Also having that factory to feed to it, and of course that Black Vice that he just played. At this stage, the Black Vice is purely food for the Atox, because Gideon's hand is too low to deal any serious damage with that Vice. He is thinking, can I go? He has to go all in. He has no choice. I mean, I don't know what's in his hand, but it seems to be his only choice. And this is difficult for Gideon. Is he going to risk it? Is he going to block with his Mishra's factory the Atok taking damage? And, and, and the risk here is a Chain Lightning or a Lightning Bolt, because that would mean a win by the Atok player. I mean, this is the decision for this first game. This is it. Of course he animates, goes to six. Of course he does that. That's the obvious choice. Ooh, a lightning bolt. Interesting, interesting. Maybe I would have waited, to be honest. Interesting here. So the Sarah dies to the Atok. He has to do that, and the Suchi is still on the board. And that's it! Wow! <laughs> oh, amazing here! I am really surprised. After that double time walk, I expected the Urnum Genon player to take the victory here, but that is uh, that is not what happens. Atok player, the aggressive aggro red deck, well, well played. You're the winner of this first game, 1-0. Let's give these players some time to sideboard, and we'll catch up with them in game number two.
Game number two is about to begin. You see the players cutting each other's decks, making sure everything goes fair here. We see the hand, we see that blue elemental blast from the sideboard, and it's a library turn one here for the Urnum Geddon player. And there we see a Mishra's Factory into a Mana Vault, perhaps. Of course, the Atok player will probably, or will probably, he will have boarded in Red Elemental Blast. So this could be a little bit of a blast war, this, uh, this second game. And there's a Tundra here. And there is a Basic Mountain. Tapping for four. No, not a Suchi, but a Bad Moon, of course. Oh, that is costly because you also cannot use your Mana Vault anymore. So that is a well-placed Blue Elemental Blast. And with the remaining one mana animating the factory to at least get some damage in here. But look at that Loa doing work already. Drawing extra cards. And it's really important here for the Aether player to get rid of that extra card as extra land, uh, extra card engine. That's what I'm trying to say as soon as possible. And look at that. Maybe, who knows, maybe the Urnum player is going on overdrive here himself. Passing turn now, Savannah line on the table and a Black Lotus. There is a desert. Is he going to attack? Tapping for two, playing an Ankh of Mishra. Of course, having that desert and that will protect him from the lions. They're drawing three here for Gideon. And it's really nice to see these deserts being played. They're just wonderful protectors against weenie decks. And in this case, against the Savannah Lions. I have to be honest, I personally tend to choose for a maze instead of a desert. But I can understand. The desert definitely has its charm. And there we see a regrowth after the use of that Black Lotus. And there is an energy flux, again a card from the main board. And a strip mine on the desert, that means two damage in here. And there we see the Atok player sacking here. And the funny thing is I'm now recognizing that desert and that must be Thijs because he's a big fan of deserts. So I guess it's Thijs here against Gideon in this quarterfinal. Attacking now and Gideon going on 12. But it's not looking very well for the Atok player here. Facing Aloha, and look at his board state. It's not very impressive. Ooh, a time walk to make matters worse. Attacking again. That means he goes to 15, but that's not his biggest concern. Drawing, playing, drawing. Probably going to activate the Loa again. Okay, first he's going to attack. So he's going to 13 here. Now he's drawing an extra card. Still has four mana left. Playing another land here, having five, or did he already play a land? I think that's what they're discussing. And it is difficult to keep track here because he also played that time walk earlier. And I think they're concluding that he has played a land before. Tapping the Tropical Island. Is it to animate his factory? But he already attacked. So that's it's probably for mana here. Playing a Birds of Paradise. And playing the Serendip Afrit. The 3-4 flyer. That dealt so much damage in the previous game. But remember, in that game, the Aatrox player, Thijs, was able to make an, a fantastic comeback. And will he be able to do that now? Playing three, maybe another bad moon. Wheel of Fortune, okay, that can, you know, that can help you a little bit. And he has to discard his Ancestral Recall there. So I'm sure the Aatrox player will be happy with his decision. What I always find difficult when you're playing red is that a Lightning Bolt and a Chain, they just don't kill that Surrender Pafrit. That's always hard. They don't kill a Sarah Angel. And you just don't want to pay two Bolts to kill one creature. You know, it doesn't feel right. It feels great to, to play a bolt on a hippie, but playing two bolts on a surrender by free, yuck. And now there's the attack for five. 
So that means that Thijs will go down to eight unless he plays something. You're probably thinking about bolting that lion, deciding not to. And the desert would have been really helpful here. Having that extra damage being dealt by a desert to that surrounded Pafrit and then playing the bolt. I mean, that feels completely different than playing a double bolt. And here we see a Sarah Angel from Gideon. And I don't think there's a way out here for Thijs, but who knows? He's got five land. Two of them are factories to three basic mountains on the battlefield. What can he do? He needs a miracle. He needs a red balance. Looking at his hand again. What to do, what to do. He's really in the tank here. The problem is he's facing three creatures. Two of them are flying. The first thing he needs to do is just being able to block one of those flying creatures. Or is he, oh, he's just gonna attack for four here, it seems. Hoping for a block maybe and then play a bolt. Yes, that's what he's doing. Oh, blue elemental blast, end game. Oh man, that is brutal. That is brutal. Okay, but that does mean we do get to see game number three. And I'm really excited about this. I think this really was really, really a blue elemental blast game. We didn't see any red elemental blast. So let's, uh, let's go to game three and uh, see what's gonna happen. Game number three, and it's the eight up player on the play. And it's 1-1, so the winner of this will advance to the semifinals of the Camel Trophy. So on the left we have Thijs sitting with his Atok deck, his Desert Atok in the Desert deck, and he's playing against the Blue Urnum Geddon deck. And interesting to note actually here, he hasn't played a single Armageddon. I believe Gideon on the right, that's his name, is playing with two of them. And there we see just a past turn here, keeping a blocker for that Savannah line. Attacking here, and of course it's hard because, okay, there's a lightning bolt that's not difficult at all. I wanted to say it's always difficult because you're thinking, am I going to animate my factory when you're playing against white? There's so much risk. Uh, there's that nice strip mine, probably, it can, this is, oh, again, an interesting idea. It's going for the white mana here, the white green savanna. And, oh, he's a bit unlucky there with that uh, Mox Pearl and Tropical Island. Of course, you have to choose at such a moment between taking care of the factory or taking care of the colored mana. He chose the latter, and that came back to bite him with that Pearl and the Tropical Island. Playing a basic land now. Beautiful Winter Factory, by the way, but it's always difficult when you're playing against white. As soon as you animate it, there are eight cards that can destroy it. Eight cards, four swords, and four disenchant. That's making it a little bit shaky. And that's probably why he doesn't have any trouble, problem with this Blood Moon here. And there is, of course, that Mox Pearl for a possible disenchant. There we see the disenchant. Four damage here dealt already on 12. The Atok player here, Tice, he's in a corner. He needs to do something. And that Soul Ring and that Mox is giving him some advantage as well. The um, the Urnum Ganon player, there is an Atok, but just a single Atok with no artifacts. Of course, he could animate his own factory to feed it to the Atok, but that's not your uh, your preferable, pre preferred line of play. <laughs> okay, that was a bit of a tongue twister. There we see a block on the Savannah Lions, trading it for the Atok. He's going to nine because of that pump with the other factory. Let's see what Thijs can do. We're playing mountain number three. Tapping for four, there is a Suchi, so at least that's a powerful blocker. Ooh, Divine Offering. Not only does it take your artifact, it also gives the caster life. So we see Gideon going to 24. Atok player Thijs is on five. What can he do? Casting another Suchi. And just passing turn here from Gideon. So it looks like the Suchi is buying Thijs some time. Maybe he can rebuild. Maybe finding some bolts to take care of the factories upon animation. Tapping for four. Oh, this is actually pretty good at disc because that gives you some control. And this is nice. Okay, the tables have turned. It's 
Thais has managed to kind of stabilize here. Stuck on five life. And this is an interesting ATOG build because it's much more a control ATOG build than your aggressive ATOG build. And that's also what we've what we've been seeing here in this matchup. Tapping for a lot. Will we see a brain geyser here? Yes, and this could change the game. Brain geyser probably means it's gonna draw into flyers, draw into blue power and all that shenanigans. Interesting here is that he doesn't tap his factories. Because he's got 24 life, so he can just take the damage. And maybe now he's going to play something to force Thais um, to use that disc next turn. He's attacking and they're animating. And of course this attack is already kind of signaling that he wants to... Yeah, there he goes. So he's trying to attack his, his mana base, making sure that... Do we see a Blood Moon? Oh, a double ank. I like this. Very aggressive play. And has Thais found a line to kind of win this game here? Ooh, a double birds. That means five mana. That probably means a Sarah Angel. And those birds are so annoying when you're playing with Ank of Mishra. Because they work around the Anks. There we see another Larry Nevin's disc. And these discs are giving Thais control over the game, and which is very important at this stage since he's only at five. And the question is, is he going to play something? Okay, playing a Chaos Orb. And he wants to flip the orb on the disc, of course, because it's still tapped, and that's a hit. So that means that next turn... Ooh, look at that. Oh, not next turn. Nothing next turn. This turn, playing a Surrender per Free, taking, of course, four damage from the Ankh. But remember, Thais is only on five here. It's going to deal some damage. Doesn't matter much. Going to 16, playing a Soul Ring. Taking a damage from the surrender, going to 15 here. Attacking, going to 2. So that means one more turn left for Thais. Will we see a Sarah Angel here? No, we're going to see an Urnum Jin. 4 5 powerhouse from the Arabian Nights. We need a city in a bottle. That could save him here. We don't see a city though. That's it. That's game. That's game. And um, I wonder, Thais, maybe uh, you can let us know in the comments when you're watching this match. Did you board in a city? Uh, and did you board in Red Elemental Blasts? Because I didn't see them at all. But what an incredibly nice match this was. And that means that Gideon, the player on the right, with his blue Urnum Ganon deck. Did I see some black there as well? I guess he's also playing with the Demonic. Maybe then also a Mind Twist? I think only Demonic. Anyway, we'll see Gideon advance to the semifinals. And of course, you can see those semifinals right here on Timmy Talks, your channel for old school magic. And uh, that will go online next week, Tuesday. So put it in your agenda. Put it on the calendar. Uh, if you want to support the channel, subscribe, become a member, and uh, leave a comment. What you can also do, you can support us now on Patreon. So you can check out Patreon. You can click the link. For now, let's go to the end scroll and see who is supporting Timmy Talks. Let's take a look at our patrons. What shall we do with the drunk Just think it's a samba kazee!